G'day guys and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. I'm your host Simon Rinney and today we're getting mindful about mental health. If mental health discussions do trigger you, please feel free to skip this episode, that's okay. But if you do stick around and you do get triggered, make sure that you reach out to your support networks afterwards. And joining me for today's discussion, I've got Josh Binger from Gippsland, Victoria. How are you going, Josh? Yeah, good, brother. Just sitting down here in the shitty weather at the moment. It's pissing rain and it's windy, so I'm hiding inside my folks' house. So doing well, man. What about yourself? Yeah, no, we have got an absolute pearler of a day, mate. I've been out on the treadmill today i'm going to go for a walk afterwards i've just tuned into a new podcast with hamish blake it's how other dads dad and it oh, is okay. hilarious you've got to check it out if you haven't checked it out i'm going to go listen to another episode and go for a walk i did used to listen to them quite a bit so i'll check it out i find hamish and andy quite funny oh they're hilarious and he just takes it to the next level being dad myself i could really tune into what he was saying and understand it but anyway that's another podcast we're on the mind for men <laughs> podcast here thanks so much for joining me mate i was fortunate to come on the on the men podcast with you and share some of my stories so i thought it'd be great to have you on my show and hear your story as well because you are working in the mental health space and and I love having chats about men's mental health, but you also have done some work in the death industry as well. So I'm keen to explore what that is and also work that you do with Broski as well. So let's start it off and hear a bit about you and tell the audience where you grew up and some of the school life and what you did after school. What's some of those key life events for you? Yeah, cool. So I've been a Gippsland boy pretty much my whole life. I grew up in a little town called Briagalong. It's a bit of a mouthful, little country town, farming town, full of some really good people. And yeah, went to school at the local primary school, went to Mafra High School, lived there for a bit. And then I started studying in Melbourne, studied a paramedicine degree. So I lived up in Melbourne for a few years up there while studying, did a bit of work and now I've moved back to Mafra. I had a pretty good upbringing. My parents stayed together. I was probably brought up in a pretty low socioeconomical family, but Still, parents did everything they could to provide for me and yeah, had a pretty good life and dealt with some bullying when I was younger, which is probably where a lot of my hardships started. From primary school, grade one, right through to probably grade six, so the whole duration of primary school. So dealt with a lot of like mental and physical bullying from maybe one or two people and that was relatively consistent. I didn't really understand what mental health was back then and how it was affecting me, so I just kept being a kid and, and whatnot. I was a chubby boy as well. So I was a pretty easy target for people. I was overweight most of my life. So pretty easy for people to poke shit at me and give me a hard time. And then moving over to Mafra in high school, I had a pretty good start there, maybe for the first year, but I was still a big boy and, and copped a lot of physical and verbal abuse off a group of dudes who followed me from primary school to high school. And then that group got bigger and yeah, copped a few bashings and, and a lot of psychological bullying as well and that started to affect me pretty young and that's when I really started dealing with probably depression and anxiety quite a lot and mm -hmm. I've sort of become a bit more introverted and enclosed built sort of a social anxiety had a good group of mates still but we were also all targets of that sort of bullying so yeah it was pretty rough I had a bit of a hard time in high school and had a suicide attempt which was my only probably like decent attempt at suicide when I was about 15 and then sort of going through I just sort of live with depression and anxiety and it just got worse and worse and then started experiencing some OCD stuff which we spoke about with you and really brought to light some of the things that I was dealing with and then yeah outside of school year 11 and 12 was pretty good for me I had a really good group of mates a lot of the dudes who would give me a hard time left mm -hmm. school around year 11 or year 10 so 11 and 12 I had a really good time and I lost like a significant amount of weight then and yeah it got a bit better for me and then later on in life it came back again do you remember like what the bullying was all around? Was it around your weight or was it other things as well? Oh, it was around anything that they could poke shit at me for, man. A lot of it was my weight related bullying. Like a lot of it. People used to like put sticky notes on my back saying like, fat fuck, go kill yourself, wide load, you know, kick me, just shit like that. I learned to react. So I was very hyper aware of my situations. I was like high anxiety levels in my sympathetic drive was very high and I reacted a lot and that's why I think I got more shit because I kept yeah. reacting and when I was younger I used to go to the teachers and try and do the right thing like morally do the right thing and then it learned that you know punching people 
sort of worked a bit more but then I mean I'd cop it back anyway so I didn't really win in that situation I remember like I hit a kid in the face he was giving me a hard time for months and he actually pushed me over and I punched him in the face and I got suspended and he didn't so I felt like throughout all the high school no matter what I did I couldn't win and it sort of got on top of me a bit there at one stage and being a young boy I just I couldn't really process the emotions I didn't know how to process emotions and I didn't know what to do really because no mm. matter what I did I'd, I'd get punished so sort yeah. of lose lose did you talk about it with your parents my mum and dad were really supportive they knew like what was going on and because I'm an only child I was very close to my parents my old man who we're really close now probably close when I was younger and, and we're close now but through that period in time I had a lot of anger issues and from unexpressed emotion and shit building up he didn't really know how to deal with it because he's like an old school sort of man. He doesn't really express emotion at all. So his job or what he did to make things better was provide for the family. That's all he knew how to do. And he's a good man for that. But so I was really close with my mum. And mum sort of probably had a lot more influences on me. Hence why I used to be more of a feminine guy. And yeah, so I did speak with my parents a bit, but probably like when I was very depressed and I attempted suicide, like they probably didn't know the extent of it then. Not many people did really know the extent of it then. Without going into too much detail around the suicide attempt, yeah. what was going through your mind at that time? Did you think that was the only way out? How did you get through that as well? Yeah, so it did feel like the only way out. I sort of blocked it out of my mind for a long time and pretty traumatic experience. I can't really remember what I was feeling that much. I know a lot of people say they feel empty with depression and you know, usually before they attempt suicide. I didn't really feel empty. I just felt like a lot of pain, Not obviously not physical pain. I was self-harming. A little bit at that point in time as well which was sort of crazy to me because that actually felt like it eased my pain not the significant self-harming no i wouldn't say like dangerous self-harming but you know just like cutting and and that sort of thing and yeah i just felt a lot of pain dude i don't know how to really explain it just felt heavy like life felt very heavy and like i just felt trapped which is what i've felt most of my life I felt very trapped and just in my body like i couldn't feel happiness and i couldn't really get rid of that stress and that anxiety it just sort of beat me down and yeah I just felt horrible like that sick feeling you get in your stomach that was there all the time and I was very tired I wasn't sleeping I was drinking a lot I started mm. drinking when I was about 13 and no illicit drug use but I drank a lot like bottles of scotch you know stuff like that and that sort of I didn't understand at the time but that debilitated my mental health as well obviously that's probably when I was having the most fun really was when I was drinking but I'd also have like emotional breakdowns and aggressive outbursts at that age, just punch walls and mm. you know, just dumb shit like that to get my anger out. So yeah, and then I attempted suicide once and I believe it was a legitimate attempt. I didn't go well, but I had no real ongoing damage or, or any issues with that. No one really knows about it at all except my parents mm -hmm. and my ex-partner. No one else knows about it at all. I don't think I've even spoken about it on a podcast before. This is the first potty I've been on. So the way I got through it was, I don't really know, man. I didn't really see a psychologist. I didn't do any self-help stuff. I didn't look after myself at all. It scared me when I did it. And I just thought, oh, fuck, I'm not doing that again. And yeah. it really did scare me quite a bit. So I just sort of went through that suffering, like probably mental suffering for quite some time until around year 11 year 12 and life picked up a lot for me then and and then i went downhill again so year 11 year 12 was better obviously the guys yeah. some of those guys had moved on and left school talk us through the end of school and then you said you went off to do paramedicine yeah, yeah so, about that yeah so the end of school was really good i had sort of made some friends with a really good bunch of guys that all of them like drinking and using some party drugs and stuff but they're all really good dudes they treated me well they were well liked for most of the school one of them became a pt tommy and tommy was pretty straight shooter pretty clean guy and he's gone off to do some amazing things so i started PTing with him and i dropped about 30 kilos and you know with that i guess a lot of other problems started to fix themselves i was sort of interacting with women more i felt mentally better I was doing a lot of training. I trained twice a day, six days a week and put on a lot of muscle. I just felt really good about myself, very confident. Mm -hmm. And so that, that was good end of the school. I didn't do one year 12. I pretty much failed. My age, I was like 39. I think I nearly failed year 12. I wasn't academic at all. I think because I had a lot of issues throughout that time in my life, I didn't really retain a lot of information. And then I left school and before I went to do paramedicine, I worked with the forestry. So I got mm -hmm. a job 
a week after I finished year 12 with Forest yeah. Fire Management. And I worked with them for five years and that was life-changing for me because I, I worked with a really good bunch of people. And I kept, my fitness sort of went down when I started working there, but I maintained it somewhat. And yeah, I had a, a good four, four or five years there. And then I started studying paramedicine and moved to Melbourne. And it was good for a, a little bit. I moved in with a guy who used to be one of my best friends in high school. I moved in with him and he was, he seemed like a straight shooter at the time, but he wasn't, he was a drug user and he stole me car and you know, fucked me car up. And that's when my mental health, you know, in the first year uni started going downhill. I also had a lot of chronic illness problems, which is a bit crazy, but I had a pen lid stuck in me right lung, which I wasn't aware about, which was occluding 90% of me right bronchus, you know, probably since a child. So I was always diagnosed with asthma, but once, once I started going to uni, I started getting really sick and like caught lung infections every couple of weeks. I was on mm. constantly on antibiotics, just coughing up blood every day. They had no idea what was wrong with me at all. So I was spending lots of money going to the doctor. I stopped going to the doctors and I just sort of lived with it. But with that became a decrease in exercise an increase in stress and like food related or stress related eating. And then the mental health came back and really started to, to haunt me again. Yeah. And, and for anyone who's watching this on YouTube, we'll put it up on YouTube as well. I did have a chuckle about the pen lead story because <laughs> you, you tell the story on your podcast and it is a fascinating story and one where you were quite crook and people couldn't figure out what was going on and it ended up being this pen lead. Did you ever work out how you got a pen lead stuck inside of you? Nah. I was talking to me folks about it. I've been diagnosed with asthma as a young child and they reckon I've obviously picked a pen lid up off the ground. I was chewing it. I've aspirated it as a young child. It's got stuck. And what actually happened was I lived with a constant wheeze and a cough for my whole life. But what actually happened was the scar tissue started sort of healing over it over yeah. time. And that's what started occluding my right bronchus. It sort of fell down my lung like that. Mm. And then the scar tissue went over the top of it and started occluding it. I was constantly hypoxic. So I had lack of oxygen to my, I'm sure I killed a few brain cells there. I'd try and exercise. I'd collapse, you know, from lack of, like lack of oxygen, you know, coughing up blood every day. I had to sleep sitting up in a chair because if I'd laid down, I couldn't breathe. And then that was like, obviously accompanied, as I said, with like constant lung infections, mm. which was really like, it was horrible. It was pretty bad. Like I laugh about it now. But in the time, it was fucking terrible. No matter what I did, I couldn't get better. I just got worse. Like I was on tons of medication. My GP actually told me that, you know, I could die. I was getting very concerned. And that's when I went on a wait list for a lung specialist. That was an 11-month wait. And then I got to the point that I was that sick. I became septic and had several presentations to the hospital and several IV antibiotics. And then... I just decided to pay for a, a private specialist, which was the best thing I ever did. It was fucking expensive. It was like $500 an appointment and you didn't get any money back. And it was like a 15 minute appointment, but he saved my life. He sort of looked at it straight away and was like, nah, we need to fucking do this, 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 and this. Bulk testing, like cystic fibrosis, COPD, all these other medical conditions that affect your respiratory. I think I had like TB. They, they thought I had lung cancer at one point which was terrible as well. Ooh. Thinking, you know, you're going to die with lung cancer. It was fucking horrible. So yeah, I went in for a bronchoscopy when they put a camera down your throat and they have a look at what's going on. And they wanted to take some samples, flush my lungs out. It's meant to take 15 minutes. They knocked me out unconscious. I woke up halfway through the procedure because obviously they've gone down. They've gone, fuck, we found something. So they decided to cut it out then and there. They, they assessed it and thought it was safe enough. But I actually woke up halfway through the procedure, sat up on a table and coughed up a shit ton of blood. And I thought, I thought they dropped something down me. Lung? Like, I don't know what the fuck. I was panicking. I was freaking out. They resedated me, cut it out, and then got an infection after that. And then probably a month later, I was fine off all medications. But the mental impact from that was was long lasting. I didn't realize how much of an impact that had on me. Well, it just goes to show sometimes we get to a point where we just need to pay that 500 bucks as expensive as it was. By doing that, not only did you prioritize your physical health, but that's helped conceptualize things from a mental perspective as well because it was so impactful on your life it is an amazing story just to listen to it and you do a great job on your podcast as well there is an episode dedicated to it but often we disregard things as guys particularly we disregard our health and well-being and go i'm not pay for that i'm not going to pay for that and look what happened when you did come to that realization that you needed to sort it out you got the help you needed, yeah. and you got the answers that you needed as well you didn't have to think about it and somebody just said this is what's going on and this is how we can help yeah, I'd seen a lot of lung specialists public 
I think that was a big difference between private and public for me was the quality and people you see. I think the public system's pretty good, but you know, this guy, his name was Dr. James Bartlett. He's based out of Werribee Respiratory Clinic. They actually did a case study on my case and was presented to people in different countries and all that sort of shit because no one could believe that I was still alive. And yeah, I encourage people, if you've got something wrong, don't put it off. I had a few other chronic issues, like I've got a low back condition which I recently found out was non-operable and will just constantly provide me pain for the rest of my life. And I put that, I put off that getting managed for probably four or five years because I didn't want to know. And I, mm. I didn't want to spend the money. I think it was the big thing because I, I didn't have a lot of money back then. I really struggled. I think you should definitely prioritize your health. And if something's really bothering you and it's consuming a lot of your thought processes, you know, that consumes energy. It messes with your mental health. Like just get it sorted. Just deal with it because yeah. if like pretending that nothing's wrong or pretending that it's not bothering you and whatnot, it just gets you nowhere. Like, and you just don't realize how much it bothers you. Yeah. So you've been on a mental health journey for quite some time, right? Keen to hear from your perspective, what does having good mental health mean to you? So good mental health, what does it mean to me? So there's a few things. I don't think we can always be like on our A game. I think people perceive people with good mental health to always be well i don't think that's the case i think we all have our hard times and our struggles but good mental health like personally means to me and it's i relate it back to my physical health quite a lot because my physical health has always been a problem and that's probably been the number one thing that's that's affected my mental health and they've sort of bounced off each other so to me like good physical health is a big one it's probably the number one thing for me but also just your ability to cope with like what comes at you, like building a good resilience, being able to process emotions well, that sort of stuff I think is very important. And I think if you don't have good mental health, you can't do those things. And you're, you also want to have a good quality of life and function well in society and be proud of what you do. And that all encompasses good mental health. You know, if you don't have good mental health, then you can't do any of those things. I've always related it back to having a good quality of life. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think... What you said there without saying that is also good mental health can be a reflection on what's going on as well. You said there like an acknowledgement that it's not always good as well, that there are yeah. peaks and troughs. And I look at it as a bit of a roller coaster, like some days are up, some days are down. But as long as you're tuning into that, I think that's a good, good thing to do because it could recognize that maybe there's something in your life that's lacking at the moment. Maybe you're drinking too much. Maybe you're eating the wrong foods. Maybe you're not exercising. Mm. You're not sleeping. Maybe you're having a shit time at work and you need to resolve that or in a relationship. And it's a reflective part, I think, which brings about good mental health through recognizing the things that are triggering you at that point in time. Yeah, I agree. I think having a good routine, don't eat well for your body, eat well for your mind, because all that's intertwined. If you're not eating good. And, you know, like I'm still overweight and I'm very aware of that, but I also used to be 100, 155 kilos and, you know, not able to function. And my mental health was absolutely terrible. So eat well for your mind as well, not just for your, for your body. Um, Cause all those will work together. Good routines, good connection with people, like good support systems. You need all those sorts of things to function well. And if people say, oh, well, I'm introverted, but you know, sitting inside for three weeks at a time, not talking to anyone's not good for you. I'm somewhat introverted as well, but I still have good social connections. I, I put myself in situations where I might challenge myself, but not where I feel super uncomfortable to the point I'll have like an anxious breakdown. And so like there's those things as well. If you don't have a good routine, you can have a bad time because everything's chaos. Definitely. Yeah. I'm interested to know. So you've gone through all these physical things and seen lots of specialists. When was the first time that you went and spoke to someone about what's happening mentally? Yeah, so I guess I was pretty open with some of it with my parents, but my ex-partner who I lived with when I was at uni, she was a really good support for me. And undoubtedly, my mental health took a, a big toll on her as well. It definitely affected her massively, which is completely understandable. So I was pretty open with her. Obviously, she's seen some of the things I was doing. I, I suffer from, and not so much anymore, OCD and trichotillomania and like ripping out all my beard hair. I was doing all those sorts of behaviors and I was also like eating lots of food and which was affecting her as well because she was engaging in the same behaviors. But she was very aware of my, my struggles. She was around when, you know, I had my emotional breakdowns and whatnot. So, you know, she, she's seen it all the time. So in terms of that, that was probably around my first year of uni when we yep. moved in together. So I talked to her about it a bit, but I also like told her, you know, I'm fine. I'll be right. And, you know, don't worry about it. But obviously I wasn't.
So the first time I opened up to a psychologist was probably around, like just after I finished uni, I'd split up with my ex and I was in a very, very bad headspace. And I thought I'd go and see a psychologist and I seen a couple that were shit. And I found one who was really, really good. And I seen her once a week and whatnot. So that was really good. And I found like after the sessions, I'd have a different perspective on myself, which I find psychologists are very good for. People often say like, they don't care. They're not paying you. And it's like, well, it doesn't really matter if they don't care. In my opinion, I, I don't think that's the importance of it. I think the importance is what they teach you. Their job mm. is to teach you things and, and show you like different perspectives on yourself and why you're doing things. So like some psychologists do care and they're really good psychologists, but you know, like you, you also do pay them. So <laughs> they're there because they're getting paid. But yeah, in my opinion, that was probably the best interaction I had with a psychologist at that time. She helped me through some pretty hard times and, but she left without any warning. She had a, a family crisis come up. So then that sort of threw me back in the, in the shit wagon a bit when I yeah. lost that structure and routine. And then I was, I didn't want to go through the process of looking for another good psychologist. So I didn't, and it was quite a time before I started seeing another one. Yeah. You mentioned going around and having to find one and, and having some shit ones, basically. Very similar to my journey over the 10 years, trying to find the right fit. What some of the things that you did to recognize that they weren't the right fit for you? Was there some red flags that you were seeing? Yeah, I think like I just didn't feel comfortable. Like they mm. weren't very welcoming. One of them, the first one I ever seen, literally I went there and she printed off of like, it was like 68, 69 pages of fucking like, content of just like what is depression how do you manage it what is anxiety what is ptsd like all this random shit i did a test which showed i was severely depressed which is funny because when you go there like obviously you're going to test bad because you're in a bad mindset but i was pretty depressed but then you know she said go home and read this and it was 140 dollars, and i was just like no connection she mm. didn't really give a fuck like she didn't like want to know how I was feeling and what was going on so we could start figuring things out. So that was a red flag for me. Just another couple, I just didn't feel comfortable around. I don't know what it was, maybe like personality clashes or, or just differences. I wanted to be told like straight up, like what's going on? What do you think is going on? What am I doing wrong? What could I be doing better? What behaviors do I need to be impacted? Like, I just like being told straight up in a sense. I don't like beating around the bush. I'm not really a holistic approach kind of person. That's just me. Like in terms of psychology, like I'm not a holistic approach. I'm a bit more factual and, and science-based person. So I wanted to, like, if there was therapies to do like CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy or, you know, habit reversal therapies, that sort of thing, that's what I wanted to do. And the psychologist that I've seen, she was really good. She identified problems immediately from my childhood, things that I'd blacked out and, and I knew it had happened just with the bullying and stuff. I just never addressed it. And she's yep. like, this is where you've come unstuck. We need to sort that out before we can move forward. Yep. I found that very helpful. Yeah. Wonderful. And it highlights a very valid point is that we can try different therapy styles or therapists and fail, but the key is to keep going, getting back on the wagon, trying to find the right fit. And you do get to a point where you become overloaded, like when your therapist left and then you didn't want to go through that process again immediately. Yeah. And I've done something similar, like where I just didn't want to talk about it because I felt like I was talking about the same thing just with different therapists. Okay. But over time, you find the ones that you connect with and you recognize, okay, yeah, this is the kind of therapist I'm looking for. Someone who can get straight to the point perhaps, or someone who specializes in a certain type of therapy as well. Like yeah. I've, done, yeah. I've done the CBT thing, but it wasn't until... I found mindfulness through one therapist through my burnout story, but then trying to deal with OCD, I found someone who did with exposure response prevention, which was really useful for OCD. And so yep. just finding the right fit. And I think it's not until your trial and error that you can work out what works for you. So I'm glad that you shared that journey as well, because we can often feel yeah. dejected. And we try it once we pay $140 or $200 or $500 yeah. <laughs> okay. and then you go, Oh, that wasn't what I expected. So you kind of hesitate to go again, but it is really about trial and error. I agree. I think like some people might want a holistic approach to their mental health and there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's just what works for you. I mean, mm. that's with anything. Like it's what works for you as long as you're not hurting people while you're doing it. I know like price puts a lot of people off, but there are a lot of government funded programs out there to you know support people. So there's one called Rural Health Connect. If you go see GP, you get a mental health plan. Um, then they'll send it off to Rural Health Connect or you can send it off to Rural Health Connect and then engage in 10 free sessions with a psychologist, which can be up to 20 that's paid by the government. I'm not sponsored or anything by them. That's, <laughs> I've used it before and maybe there's heaps of psychologists you literally can pick online. You know, I want to help with OCD. I want to help with depression. Yeah. I want to help with behavioral disorder or whatever. 
and then it'll bring up the psychologists that specialize in that field. I was using that up until recently and I had a very good psychologist and it was very successful. So don't think you have to go and pay, you know, 200 because psychologists are expensive. Don't think you have to go and pay a fortune to see a psychologist. There are always other alternatives for people as well. Yeah, definitely. Shout out to anyone who does want to sponsor this episode. <laughs> Bloody hell, yeah. yeah. Just remember on the mend podcast. <laughs> <laughs> now um, I want to get back to uni and, and why paramedicine, why did you um, pick that particular degree to go for? Yeah, probably a lot of personality. As I said before, I'm probably a bit more of a feminine guy. So I've got a lot of, I, I like connecting with people. I'm very good at tuning into empathy and sympathy and, and those sorts of things. Some, a lot of stuff I've learned off my mum. So I was in the CFA country fire authority when I was young as a volunteer. I loved it. It was definitely part of my identity and sort of in a small community, builds a family. It was really good. I moved on to the SES for a little bit. I, I didn't really grow up wanting to be a paramedic. Like everyone always says that, oh, I just knew like when I was younger, that wasn't really me. As I said, I did bad in year 12 and I never thought I could sort of go to uni. And then I, I was, was down in Melbourne with my ex-girlfriend at the time. She was looking at uni courses and there's a paramedic stall there. And, you know, I've always had a lot of respect for paramedics and, you know, I just never thought I could do it. And I went and spoke to them and one of them was in a CFA. So I built a bit of a rapport with him that way. And said, you know, you could be a paramedic dude. I was like, nah, like I did real shit at uni. He's like, there's other ways around it. And sure enough, literally applied with that Victoria University mature age program. And within two weeks I was enrolled in the degree. I did pretty well in uni, like I averaged HDs and that was really good for my mental health. It was stressful. And I worked very hard with a group of people who worked very hard as well. And it was very stressful and, you know, it wasn't a good time in my life, but the uni really gave me something to focus on. It gave me structure. It gave me routine. Yeah. And even though I was, was unwell at the time, yeah, it sort of gave me something to look forward to and, and goals to achieve. And so I'm very grateful I picked that path and, and I didn't know if I'd really love it that much. I was volunteering for the ambulance service. I forgot to mention I did volunteer for the ambulance services, like a first responder for a few years, which was, is definitely relevant. I did enjoy that. So I thought I might enjoy doing paramedicine as well. So I sort of went down that path and yeah, got a job and you know, it's quite hard to get a job as a paramedic. So that was another mm. stressful part of it as well. It's very, very difficult. Well, up until COVID, it was very difficult. And yeah, and it was, you know, the first year's hard and I started doing it and I just, I really enjoy it. Like it's quite good. Some things are you know harder than others in the job and there's definitely challenges, but it's a pretty good job. You get looked after well. And I love talking to people, dude. I just, I fucking love talking to people. And, you know, if you work with a good person who's done well with you, have a bit of banter with the, the people you see, your patients, and they just love it. I enjoy looking after people as well. And that's that's yeah. definitely part of my, my feminine side, I think. For all the guys out there or anyone out there who didn't do well at year 12 and didn't get a great score and to get into uni, talk us through like the process of applying. Did you have to do any prerequisite courses to say that you could do university? What was that process like? So I applied for a couple of unis. I didn't get into ACU and I didn't get into Monash because they still look at your score regardless if it's through mature age pathway. I did get offered positions there, but I had to do a prerequisite diploma in nursing, which if I went back, I'd probably do it. I really think that would have built a better foundation as a paramedic doing some nursing as well. But I literally just went on to VU, Victoria University's website. At the time, I, th I thought it was one of the best unis for paramedicine and it had a really good reputation, which went downhill towards the end of my degree. But anyways, it said I apply as a mature age. I filled out an application. I had a bit of experience. Obviously, I was, I was volunteering for the ambulance service at that point. And I was in the CFA. I dedicated like some of my studies at school. Like we had a CFA course at school, which I did. And I did a bit of volunteering. So I just put that in this application, sent it in. I honestly didn't think I'd get in. Like I was like, this isn't going to work. Like paramedicine has a pretty high ATAR score. And I thought they'd probably still look at it anyways, but they didn't. And they said, no, we're happy to have you. It's funny, dude. We had people in that degree who fucking did awesome in high school and dropped out within the first six months mm. or failed pharmacology because it doesn't really... In my opinion, you need to be able to be dedicated to something and yeah. you need to study hard. Like if you're not academically where you need to be, you have to study hard and you just have to accept that. And maybe you just do more than other people do. I know me and my mates were pulling 14 hour days before exams, like every day. We'd get up early, we'd go into Footscray University, we'd study, we'd drink coffee, we'd go to Mackey's when all the coffee places had closed, we'd get more <laughs> coffee, we'd get burgers and we'd just study, study, study. And and they all did well. Like one of my mates, Ryan, who's one of my best mates, if not my best mate, probably my, he, he did the best out of the whole degree and yeah. he worked very, very hard. And we just had to do that because you just got to. If you think you're going to go to uni and not try, or you think it's going to be easy, you're going to go there to drink, you're not going to do well, in my opinion, unless you're super smart and you know, you can retain information, you've got a high IQ, you can interpret things easily. Um, but yeah, there's a process 
just do the process, get there, work hard. You'll get into a degree. You don't need a good ATAR to get into a, good, a degree. And just work hard and, and dedicate yourself to it and, and you'll do well. Simple as that. You don't have to be super intelligent to do a degree. You just need to put in the time and effort. Do you think going in as a mature age student though really helped you because you'd had some life experience? I dropped out of year 12 as well, went through a big depression after a relationship breakdown, went back and did year 13 and, and got the score to get into uni. But then I kind of just breezed through my undergrad, not really trying a whole bunch, but it wasn't until I returned to do my master's of social work as a mid 30 year old that I actually knuckled down and go, I'm actually here for a reason, not just to get a piece of paper. Like I'm here to change lives and change careers and better myself. Do you think mature age study helped you in that, in that sense? Yeah, man. I think mature age study was fantastic, but you can tell the people who, who come straight out of high school and, and they struggle. Like some of them struggle quite a bit because they, all they know is school. They haven't got much life experience. It's not their fault. Like that's how their education system pushes you. So I think it's good to, if you don't know what to do, don't get forced into going out and doing a degree. I think that's a bad idea. I think take a couple of years to yourself, figure out what you want to do, travel if you want, or get a job and figure out what you like and don't like. It's hard coming straight out of high school. The world expects you to have everything in line and, and understand what you want to do. And it's, it's okay not to understand. You're still young. You're very fucking young. Like you've got ages. You don't have to stress too much about it. So yeah, I think coming out and working, like as I said, I worked in a really, really good job. It was an amazing job. As a, as a fiery on summer crew. And I learned what I liked and didn't like, and I learned more about myself and where I want mm. to go. And then I could retain that knowledge and, and go and do something with it. So I think, yeah, getting some life experience is good. And I, I think like even working from a young age, I was working before I was 14 and nine months, you know, like building that sort of resilience and the hard work in you is very important as well. Like if you're sitting at home and you're not doing stuff, it's, building foundations around you that aren't good. You're going to be lazy. You're not going to do the right things for yourself. So working's good for you. Like it's good to get out and, and make friends and get out in society as well. Yeah, definitely. Now you finished the degree. Did you go from there into the death industry? And what is the <laughs> death industry? Tell us about this and how'd you land in it? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually, I struggled to get a job. So I was working with the ambulance services. Oh, they call it volunteering, but I was working with them through uni. You get paid, but only if you go on call outs, I guess it works. So I was working with them, but I really struggled to get a job anywhere. So I was working in fire and volunteering and that sort of thing. I didn't really have much experience in retail or anything like that. So I struggled to get a job. And I remember I was talking to my mate, he was a paramedicine student and he said, like I'm working in this job for this company that essentially investigate people who have died, like unforeseen death circumstances, whatever. So they're located in Melbourne. So I was working for them. He was working for them and he said, you know, come and apply. And I had seen, had been exposed to deceased people before through obviously the CFA and the ambulance service and, you know, a couple of other situations. And so I applied for that, got an interview pretty much straight away. And that was in, in the second year start a third year at uni yep. and the job essentially was called a transfer service, but essentially you would go up and pick deceased people up from where they've died, speak to their families and transport them to facility mm. where the death would be investigated. So essentially that was my, my job. I worked there for about 18 months. It was a good job. It's not for everyone. I mean, people would come and last a day. You were seeing quite a lot of like horrific things like on a regular basis. I know we would pick up like more often than not, we'd probably do like five to eight bodies a day picking up deceased and they would you know it could be anything from a heart attack to you know a child to a suicide to a homicide motor vehicle accidents to picking up from a hospital where someone's passed away and it needs to be investigated more so yeah it was hyper exposure it was very high exposure very often i was there with covid so i was working like massive amounts like probably six days a week doing that and because i couldn't see my family or friends and i just split up with my ex it was a good gig it was it definitely shaped me into a different person and it gave me a different perspective on life. I'm probably not so much of an idealist now than a realist. And I think like that sort of industry hides a lot of things from people. Like people know really fuck all about what's going on. It's, it's very well hidden. The only point you really know about us is if we're on the news or if, if you're dealing with us from a family member or a friend or something like that. I think the most important thing that that job taught me was, was about suicides. We did suicides every day. So I was picking up people often in you know, different circumstances, but often horrific circumstances where they'd taken their life. Most of them were men. Mm. I think that it shaped me into the mindset that this is a really big fucking problem and that, you know, something needs to be done about it. And that sort of changed my mindset. Yeah. Did um, that being deceased or did that 
have an impact on your mental health? Yes, it did. Not to the extent that I think a lot of people like that did that job. It did. There's a lot of people there who had a lot of, lot of problems, but for me, it was more, it just reinforced that I was constantly on edge. You know, like you go to people who are walking down the street and got hit by a car and doing nothing wrong and just, you know, like maybe a car hit a pothole and ran off the road and hit someone and killed, you know, father and daughter or something like that. So like, it just put me like on edge, like very in my sympathetic drive, very ready to respond to things, which I've always been in, but that reinforced it quite a lot. And it also reinforced that, you know, the world's kind of fucked up as well, which is not yeah. a great outlook. But the thing is when you're doing that stuff every single day, you sort of see more bad shit than you see good shit. And that sort of changes your mindset. I try to have a very positive perspective at work. You know, I really enjoyed talking to the families and talking through the process. I really enjoyed giving the person care. Now, I didn't really see the people who had died as people, but I still treated them like people. And very respectfully, I allowed the family to say goodbye and, and give them as good as experience as they could have in that situation. Mm. So I learned a lot from that job and it definitely did keep me in that sympathetic drive and you know, like if I'm walking down the street now, and I was talking about this with my psychologist about a month ago before I finished up with her. If I'm like in that mindset, I'm constantly like looking around. I'm constantly hyper aware. I know if I go to like a football game, for example, I'm like worried about terrorist attacks and like what's going to happen. Like everyone's just enjoying the game and I'm constantly looking for exits and mm. you know, that sort of thing. And in the long term, that will have a detrimental effect on my mental health. Like I get burnt out quite a lot and quite easily because I'm so fucking like up in my head and it does take a toll on the people around me as well. Cause you know, they're just enjoying their day and I'm like, Fuck. I wouldn't say paranoid just because that was my normal. That was my reality. Mm. And so that's my reality now. And I've got to learn that that's no longer my reality and that I need to get out of that mindset and, and be a bit more chilled. <laughs> yeah. I experienced something similar. So not in the death industry, obviously I've never worked in that industry, but in a public service, I, for a long time, I did kind of like compliance activities in particularly okay. in, in the immigration space. I used to work for Australian border force. And, and so we'd be doing investigations on, on companies and people all the time and, and responding to allegations of fraud. And so yeah. because I was doing that day in, day out, and my mindset shifted into one of who's doing the dodge here or who's yeah. not being compliant here or everyone's bad. And like what you were saying, very similar in terms of when you're in that kind of environment, your mindset does shift. And then it wasn't yeah. until I moved from that job into where I was with working with the NDIS space, where I, I purposely said, I'm really excited about this job because it's not in fraud. It's not investigating people. It's actually helping people. And then I could flip the script and start to see the good in people. And other people would next to me, they'd be like, oh, Simon, there's so much fraud in this industry. I'm like, you don't know anything about fraud. We're yeah, here to yeah. help people. We're not here investigating. I've been around that kind of work before. Yeah. You, you've been in the death industry before. You've seen the bad in people. Yeah. Not all the time. There was, you know, as you said, there was accidents as well. When you're in an environment, it does certainly have a way of impacting your mindset and, and how to flip that. It can be very challenging as well. How did you flip it? Did you stay in that job or have you moved on from that job? I'm a paramedic now. I don't think I actually have flipped it really. I think it's something, an ongoing thing because it was like, even with the CFA, even with the fireys, like I had a couple of close calls with them where, you know, could have died, that sort of stuff. For the ambulance service, you still, still see the things that can affect you. All these industries, you know, it requires a specific type of person, I think, who's... Yep ready to respond and act at a moment's notice. So all these things, they still affect me and it's still my reality, I guess. I'm just learning to be in the moment a bit more and not be as on edge and, and ready to react. So it's very difficult for me because I've, even with the bullying that put me in that drive, I'm constantly in that mindset. And it's, it's very difficult for me to not to be in there because it's been yeah. so long-term. It's been pretty much the majority of my life I've been like that. So I'm just taking it day by day really. And just like, if I'm, if I feel heightened, I do something to bring myself out of it. So I might go for a run. Exercise for me is the biggest thing, like mm -hmm. physical exercise, because it, it gets rid of all that sort of anxious feeling, gets rid of all those like your adrenaline and your hormones that keep you on edge and in that sympathetic system. It reduces all them, fills your body full of feel good hormones. And, you know, and then I can rest and relax a little bit more. So that was part of it as well. I mean, I wasn't exercising and I wasn't doing anything with all that built up energy. I was just sitting there constantly anxious. I, I remember I used to sit there and shake 
like really bad. And like with my weight and stuff like that, I used a lot of avoidance techniques. Like I wouldn't go out. I'd just look myself in home and I'd just sit there and shake and be really anxious. Like my anxiety is fucking still, still a problem and still something I'm going to have to deal with long-term. So yeah, it's, I'm not over it at all. I'm really not. And it's only been really been working on that and, and aware of it, consciously aware of it over the last couple of months on how much it really affects me. And, and that's just because it's my reality really. Like it's my built-in reality and I need to take myself out of that reality and over time and build a new one really. Yeah. And you mentioned before you try to ground yourself or be in the moment. What's some of the strategies you use to do that? Yeah. So I used to meditate quite a bit. I don't really enjoy meditation that much to, if I'm going to be honest with you, I really struggle to do it. And like, I used to do it really well, but I just sort of got bored of it. I don't know. Like everyone always says, oh, like we should meditate. And I believe it's, it's an effective strategy for some people, but I, I do music meditation because my brain's very active. I really struggle not to think. So I do a bit of music meditation, I do cold water therapy as well, which not every day, but most of the, most days I do. And I find that very helpful because in that moment, you're just thinking about that. It's sort of a meditation itself because you, your ability is not to think about anything. So you've got to sort of just focus on your breathing. And then that's how I incorporate my breathing. So I do the four, seven, eight method. So I find my breathing, it helps quite a lot as well. And then just exercise of probably, probably dropped 50 kilos. So I'm still in the overweight category, but I'm getting to the point now I'm coming down from that and out of the obesity category and maybe just a bit overweight and, and working on those things. So maybe more so that sort of stuff. I also do other things like I have hobbies, like go camping a lot, but that's probably not really a, a mindful technique, mindfulness, bringing myself into the moment technique. And then the other thing's gratitude. Gratitude's a big thing for me as well. Talk us through your gratitude strategy because I know a lot of people struggle in this space. Yeah. So, I mean, gratitude can be really easy. I usually journal three things I'm grateful for each morning. Sometimes I forget and you know, that's fine. But if I forget, I just do it in my head. So I, I did a podcast on this the other day about comparative gratitude. And I think it's a healthy thing. I don't think comparing yourself to people all the time is healthy at all. But I think it's better to look at in comparison to what some people have and what you have as well. So I use a thing called the soul for man, a dude who, you know, has a fucking hard life, essentially. I'm not going to go right into it, but has a hard fucking life. And I just compare myself to that. And, and it makes me feel better because then I, I start looking at everything I do have and what, rather than what I don't have, you know, mm. it's really, really, really easy to get stuck in the mindset. Like I don't have a boat. You know, I was in this mindset you know, a couple of months ago, like, you know, I really want a boat. You know, I want a jet ski. I want all these materialistic things. You know, and it brought me down heaps. Like I felt like shit. I was like, fuck dude, like I'm not getting anywhere. I don't have a house. I don't have this. I don't have that. Like, but I, you know, then I started thinking, well, I do have a roof over my head. Like it's basic, but I have it. You know, lots of people don't have that. But, you know, I, I have access to clean drinking water. You know, like the water, you know, runs down this fucking beautiful creek out of the high country, goes to a water treatment facility and then out, out of my tap. And, you know, and then it can be hot within 10 seconds and I can have a hot shower and I use fucking goat soap that's been manufactured, you know, to make my skin nice. And, you know, just stuff like that. Like if you really start breaking it down and thinking about what, what you do have rather than what you don't, it mm. makes you feel better. Like it's very easy to get stuck in the, I'm not making 500,000 a year. Yeah, you know, I don't have a supermodel girlfriend because that's what we see a lot of times as well. We see that on social media, a lot of influencers, a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, pushing this, in my opinion, somewhat bullshit lifestyle that is not the case for the majority of people. And you sort of got to get out of that mindset and, and just realize what you do have. The comparative gratitude. Do you ever compare yourself to where you were 10, 15, 20 years ago and compare that gratitude? A hundred percent. Yeah. I do that as well. Like it's really good. And that's important for growth and like reflection of goals as well. Mm. Four years ago, I was 155 kilos and depressed as fuck. And, you know, I had suicidal behaviors and ideation. So, you know, whereas I don't really deal with a lot of that now and I don't have to stress about that that much. Comparative gratitude is very important as well in that sense. If you feel bad about comparing yourself to the Joneses, be your own Jones. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's it's, like yeah, your and own journey. Exactly. Yeah. And that's a very healthy method of doing it as well. And I want to make it clear. It's not about compare. Like if you compare yourself to people all the time, like oh, this person's got a better life and stuff, that's not helpful. Yeah. It's not helpful. I just, I more use it for like reflecting on all the good things I have, I guess. Like, I think it's helpful then. I don't think it's helpful to just compare yourself to people all the time. It's not healthy at all. I know a lot of people struggle in this space and in gratitude, but I think What's coming up for me for your story is I'm grateful for that you have this story to tell 
that you're sharing it with the Mindful Men community and your own community as well through on the men podcast and through your social media. And then that tells another bloke out there who's bottled it up for years. For me, it was 20 years. And he goes, oh, fuck, you know, I'm not alone in the world. There are two other blokes talking about mental health. Maybe I can talk about it as well. There's a lot of your own story that you can be grateful for just tuning into it. Yeah, I agree, mate. You've got to do with what you've been given. I think this sort of stuff, especially mental health problems, it can go one or two ways. It can be the fuck down and you can feel like shit about it for the rest of your life and, and play into a victim mentality, which is what I was doing. You know, you can take a bit of accountability. I'm big on accountability and it's not a malicious thing at all. It's just, you take a bit of accountability, realize where you're at. It, accountability to me, it doesn't equal responsibility. You don't have to take responsibility for all the bad things that have happened to you. Sometimes bad shit happens to innocent people, but take a bit of accountability, realize where you are and realize that you're the only one that can change it and, and mm. do something with that, you know, and that'll make you a better person. It'll make you feel better as well. In my opinion, I think like, yeah, just sitting there and, and being beaten down and, and sad and, and looking for sympathy off everyone all the time and, and not making changes is just a bad fucking path to take. And it'll, it won't end well. Yeah. And it does happen though. We, talk oh, about, yeah. we have the peaks, we have the troughs as well. It's just part of the journey as well. It's just 100%. recognizing when you're on the down and go, oh, yep, I've been down here too long. I've got to get back up again. And now your self-care, is it talking to someone? Is it meds? Is it whatever works for you? And, that, and that's accountability right there. Figuring out you're allowed to have bad things that happen to you and feel like shit. Like that's fine. But you know, if something bad happens to you and you're three years down the track and still can't function, then you really need to look at like what's going on and, and how to fix that because that's, it's not good. It's not good yeah. for anyone. And we're allowed to have bad times. Dude, I had a bad week last week. I was feeling like shit. I ate shit. You know, I feel like shit. I ate shit. Made me feel worse. And then I was like, what am I fucking doing? Like, why am I doing this? And, you know, so I went to gym twice over the next three days, you know, because I knew I had to, I had to, you know, fix what I'd done. And I think it's a very important thing is taking accountability. So you mentioned before you were working in the death industry and you're seeing a lot of men in suicide. And you said that you wanted to do something about it. So what did you do about it? I know you've got broski. Is that where broski come from? Tell us a bit about this, this pathway. So when I was working there, as I said, doing suicides every day and sometimes, you know, three a day or whatever, picking up these people. And I was, I was like, holy fuck. Cause it sort of takes away from the number. Like we always just see a number at the end of the year and it's not, it's not personalized, I guess. It's like, well, it's just a number. It doesn't have really any massive impact on people. But when you're actually picking these people up every day and, and seeing what it does to their families, it really sort of grabs you. And I was, I was doing a course with a friend or whatnot, was sort of a guy running a men's course, which I did. And I found it somewhat helpful and it was good. And I connected with a lot of blokes and said, I really want to do a podcast, which I'd been putting off for a long time. And that was inspired from that. And it stressed me out. And I, so I just put it off. I didn't do it. I didn't take any action on it. And these dudes really encouraged me to do it. So I ordered the stuff and started this podcast and called it On The Men Podcast and did a couple episodes. And at that point in time, I was doing like the push up thing as well. So I was doing a bit of stuff for mental health and I did a video on Facebook and which I guess was where people probably started realizing that I actually had had that mental health journey because a yep. lot of people, pretty much everyone didn't know. So yeah, I started doing that. And then I thought, oh, I'll start a, it's called Uniting Brothers, a page, which to me, I really liked. And then I started realizing it sounded more like a church group. <laughs> and I was like, and, and people didn't really know what the fuck Uniting Brothers was. And I'd post a little bit of stuff there. And it was more just a way for me to say, if anyone wants to chat, then they yeah. can contact me. And at that point in time, I still, my mental health wasn't super great anyway. So I, you know, I was more just like looking for support and, and supporting others. And then that started to build a little bit. And I had a six month break from the podcast. I went through a bit of a, a hard time and I didn't think I should be talking about specific things in that mindset. So I, I stopped doing it for about six months and then stopped doing the page. And, and then, yeah, I, I changed it up a bit and got back into it and changed the name to Broski, which is something I really enjoy. And I call lots of my friends Broski, a lot of my bloke mates Broski. So I thought that fits a little bit better and started the podcast up again, got some advocates, started doing a local walk, We're introducing a, a men's Zoom call to start of next year which will be cool. good. And yeah, just, just doing little things to help people. I get a lot of people on like reach out to me on the page who was experiencing current crisis. So something's happened to them and they, they message a page like I'm struggling and you know, do you have any advice? And I'm very aware my advice is not for everyone and my page is not for everyone. I guess I, I like to talk about contentious issues and things that are maybe a little less politically correct, that sort of stuff. And, and some people don't like that and they yeah. make it very, you know, I get messages from people saying they don't like it, and, which is fine, but some people get something from it and, and that's why I do it. 
how do people like find Broski? It's on Instagram because I'm pretty sure that's where we connected. Is it on Facebook? Do you have a website for it? Yeah, so it's on Facebook. I don't use Facebook a lot and I probably mm-hmm. should for that page, but I, it sort of just sits there. I don't really upload any posts or anything to Facebook, but it's it's mainly based off Instagram. And in my bio, there's like a link tree where you can click on and, and go to different links. I'm doing Movember this year with a bunch of Ambo mates. So that'll be really good. You can go onto the website. We've got support services linked on there for different communities. So, you know, we've got support services on there people call for you know veterans lbgtq you know other other sort of things i've got the podcast on there as well we're planning on a few things next year which are still secretive at the moment but uh, hopefully will be released in the next couple months so yeah we're just growing slowly i've got some really good brand advocates on at the moment growing slowly so you can find us on instagram it's probably the best place to go and and or our website you can go to roski hq and, and find us there Awesome. And do you still do the clothing? I've still got some clothing. I actually, when I started doing it, I, I didn't realize how much all this would cost. I started <laughs> running some clothing to help. Yeah, dude, like you know, all this is funded by me and, and my, my job. So haven't got any sponsors for the podcast. Don't have any sponsors for Broski either. So yeah, I started selling clothing just to try and put a dent in, in uh, some of the, some of the costs of, of everything. So I was selling hoodies, still got some hoodies. I've got some hats and t-shirts coming in as well. We'll be running some like most of the money goes to running events and, and other things and just sustaining the business. My sort of vision for Broski is, you know, over, over the next 10 years is to sort of grow it into a company that provides additional services for men. So hopefully having some government funded psychologists and Broski funded and government funded psychologists and subsidized courses for men that can, you know, come in and, you know, talk to a psychologist over Zoom or do a course or something like that. And also maybe having like an on-call family violence or family lawyer on call as well, just to provide some support and some advice to men as well. That's very far away, very far away yet, but that's sort of where I'm, where we're going with it. I want it to be a thing that maybe people can access in different states as well. Yeah, I love the vision for it because it is needed in this space. And not only are you looking towards the future, but you're creating this sense of community for guys who often feel isolated. I love the idea about the walks. Talk, talk us through the walks. Is that still happening? Yeah. yeah, so we still do walks. We do walks once a month and it's just down in Gippsland here. I've also spoken to a couple of advocates who are doing their own walks as well. They just sort of thought, oh, we'll start a walk. I said, yeah, man, do it. We can advertise it on our page and whatnot as well. So yeah, they're just like an hour, hour and a half if people want to chat. Sometimes people don't want to talk about you know mental health stuff, which is completely fine. We just talk about life in general or just have a yep. bit of a joke and a laugh. It doesn't have to always be about you know about the mental health stuff at all. And then if it's raining or whatever, we'll, we might walk. We'll just go and grab a coffee and have a chat. And yeah, it's just about, I guess it's the biggest thing is, is about promoting healthy, active lifestyles whilst, you know, in general, whilst also building mateship and mm. brotherhood, which is what we're all about here. And, and talking about just like contentious issues as well. I find a lot of guys want to talk about specific issues that you know they feel uncomfortable about or aren't really seen as issues in society and and that's what broski is really about it's about talking about the hard issues and not just yeah. the, the easy stuff and the stuff that's accepted so i love that and the more we talk about those hard issues either in a group walk or through podcast through therapy the more we normalize some of this stuff as well like the more we can open up about men's mental health or even connection and loneliness like for guys to say i'm lonely you know that is in itself a taboo topic because being lonely and saying you're lonely that's not something that we're programmed to do like we're meant to just suck it up and move on and harden up and just deal with it but for a lot of guys are experiencing it particularly guys i'm seeing on the socials and the different groups that i'm in doing fifo work you know, they oh, go yeah, away from home, home. Yeah. you know, they're away from home, away from family for weeks yeah. on end and then you know, doing long hours. The same with shift workers as well. Like they're away from yep. everybody else as well. You might experience similar in your shift work. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, sometimes you don't get public holidays off and stuff like that. And then, you know, like emergency services, have very high divorce rates and very high mental health problems as well. But, you know, like so does construction industry and construction industry has got massive like, mental health problems. It's very prominent in there, like suicidality in, in the construction industry is huge. FIFO work as well, as you said, it's a big issue there as well. I think it's very important to talk about those issues. I'm not really educated, I guess, on, on the reasons why those industries, maybe more so, I understand a bit more about emergency services, obviously, but maybe not so much construction and FIFO. But I, as you said, I think it is due to like being away from family. You know, it's hard work as well. It's, it's mm. physically hard work. I don't think those industries offer a lot of mental health support. And, and you know, maybe it is the tough it out sort of 
approach that they're male dominated industries and maybe that is that approach as well so that approach it doesn't work very well either so yeah i agree i think like different things work for different people and you know like i get people contact me all the time saying you know like i feel bad for being a man i feel bad for being masculine and I'm big on that. I don't think there's anything wrong with masculine or well, there's very little wrong with traditional masculinity as well. So, you know, I think as long as you're being a good person and, you know, you want to play, you know, different roles or, or whatnot, there's nothing wrong with that. So like talking about those issues as well, gender-based mm. issues and, but also like maybe you do need to open up and talk as well. Maybe you need to embrace some of those other, you know, probably less traditional masculine things and more you know, feminine things and open up and connect with people. I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. So it just depends on what the person needs. And, you know, as you would know, you got to be very careful about what you sort of talk to people about and what you offer them as well and the advice you give them. Because, well, I'm, I'm not a professional at all in that field. I just use my own experience to sort of offer advice, I guess, and help. But I know there's been a couple of times people have contacted me and said, you know, like, I'm going to take my life or something like that. And, you know, it's, it's very hard to navigate that because one, you're not with the person, you don't know the person and all you can really do is like, say, you need to talk, like, we need to get you around a support system. We need to get you some, like some help or, or, you know, immediately. So it is difficult to navigate that stuff as well. Yeah, definitely. And I have that in my own practice. So I have yeah. a mental health therapy business and I have people calling me in crisis and I have to say, I'm sorry, but this is not a crisis support line. You know, and yep. here are some numbers for crisis support lines that you can help you who are better able yeah. to help you. That's not me. And that's okay yeah. in the mental health space as well. It's like we have to recognize okay. our limits as well. But, but Josh, I could talk to you all the time. I love having our chats. You know, they do go for a while. And, and I think if we were ever, <laughs> ever in the same room, we'd probably get that have to price apart with crowbars or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully one day we will be. We will be one day and we'll get there, but we've had a, a deep and heavy conversation and thanks so much for sharing your journey yeah. with the Mindful Men community, but I'd love to leave it off on something a little bit more positive. I always like to hear my guests plug something that makes them feel good and it doesn't have to be anything to do with mental health or the death industry or anything that we've talked about. It could be just yep. what you're listening to on the radio or I talked about that, the podcast I'm listening to with Hamish Blake at the moment, that's making me feel good. And what's yeah, something that's making you feel good at the moment? I'm going to have to go with something generic, but I mean, it, it, something makes me feel good. I love music, I'm listening to music. So music and exercise, definitely hands down at the moment is, is keeping me on track and making me feel fucking amazing. Awesome. Is there a particular song that you're really vibing with at the moment? Yeah. So I like, there's a local heavy metal band called Dream on Dreamer. They're split up now, but hear me out. I love that song. I listen, I vibe to it at gym and there's another band called Danger Kids. I, lo I love all music, man. Like I like, I like opera, I like heavy metal, I like pop, I like everything. So, but yeah, those two, those two songs at the moment, I'm sort of vibing to at the moment. So Awesome. Love it. Thanks. I might get the links for you if you've got some links to YouTube or something like that, and we'll put them in the show notes if that's all right. Yeah, man, I can send you some links. Yeah, no problems. Awesome. Oh, Josh, I'll let you go now, mate. Thanks so much for your time. I really have appreciated you sharing and being vulnerable and all that. And I look forward to catching up soon and seeing your progress with what you're doing with Broski and on, and on the Men podcast as well. I'm really excited to see your growth, mate. Thanks, brother. And just thank you for everything you do as well. You do a really good job. I love that you've got your business up and going. I know when last time we spoke, you know, it's still still in the works. You're getting your webpage up. You're doing a really good job, man. You've knuckled down. You're having a fucking crack, which is awesome. The podcast is going well. You should be really proud of yourself and, and the effect you're having on the community. Cheers, mate. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Cheers. Thanks for having me on. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure that you like it and leave a comment and then share it with your mates. Also, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a moment of future episodes to come. Thank you.